jurisdiction may be understood in three senses. Subject, matter, jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, and jurisdiction over the rest. Subject matter jurisdiction is the authority and power of the court to hear and determine cases of the general class to which the proceeding in question belongs. Diocese of Bacolod v. Comelec, January 21, 2015. For instance, the jurisdiction of the regional trial court over cases where the subject of the litigation is incapable of pecuniary estimation. Personal jurisdiction is the power of the court to bind a party or person. Jurisdiction over the plaintiff or petitioner is acquired by the filing of the complaint or petition. Jurisdiction over the defendant is obtained by service of summons or his voluntary or her voluntary appearance. Jurisdiction over the rest is the power of the court to try a case which would bind real or personal property or determine the status of a party. Original jurisdiction is that exercised by a court or body in the first instance, as for the instance, the jurisdiction of the MTC over ejectment case. Appellate jurisdiction is that exercise by a court or body over a case elevated to it by way of review. An example is a jurisdiction by the Court of Appeals over cases decided by the regional trial court and elevated to the Court of Appeals for review. Exclusive jurisdiction is that jurisdiction exercised by a court or body to the exclusion of all other courts. An example is the jurisdiction of the regional trial court over cases incapable of pecuniary estimation. Concurrent jurisdiction is that jurisdiction exercised over a case or subject matter by two or more courts or bodies. An example is a special civil action for certiorari jurisdiction over which may be exercised by the RTC, CA, and Supreme Court. What are the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in civil cases? Original. Number one, exclusive. So, petitions for certiorari, prohibition or mandamus against Court of Appeals, Commission on Elections, Commission on Audit, Court of Tax Appeals, and Sandigambayan. Its concurrent jurisdiction would be with the Court of Appeals. Petition for certiorari, prohibition, or mandamus against the Regional Trial Court and the National Labor Relations Commission. Note, all such petitions over NLRC cases should be filed with the CA unless there are compelling and exceptional circumstances. Letter B, with the Court of Appeals and Regional Trial Courts, that would be the petition for certiorari, prohibition or mandamus against courts of the first level and other bodies. And number two, petitions for habeas corpus and coaranto. How about with regional trial court? That would be actions against ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls. And with the Sandigan Bayan, petitions for certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, habeas corpus, injunctions, and ancillary writs in aid of its appellate jurisdiction and over petitions of similar nature, including co warranto in PCGG cases. With the Court of Appeals and Digambayan and Regional Trial Court, those are Petition for a Writ of Amparo, Section 3, Rule on the Writ of Amparo, Petition for a Writ of Habeas Data, Section 3, Rule on the Writ of Habeas Data. How about its appellate jurisdiction? There would be the petition for review on certiorari against Court of Appeals, Sandigan Bayan, regional trial courts in cases involving the constitutionality or validity of a treaty, international or executive agreement, law, presidential decree, proclamation, order, instruction, ordinance, or regulation. Legality of a tax, imposed, assessment, toll, or a penalty in relation thereto. Jurisdiction of a lower court and the pure error or question of law. Criminal case or cases, Tan versus people, 
3.81-75. Note that appeals from MTC decisions, even if on pure question of law, is to the RTC, and that an appeal from the RTC's decision rendered in the exercise of appellate jurisdiction is to the CA, even if on pure questions of law. Court of Tax Appeals in Bank, Section 19 of RA 1125, as amended by RA 9282. Final judgment or order in a writ of amparo or habeas data case. Section 19, rule on the writ of amparo. Section 19, rule on the writ of habeas data. How about the jurisdiction of the Court of Appeals in civil cases? Let's have the original jurisdiction that would be exclusive on actions for annulment of jurisdiction of regional trial courts. Special civil action for certiorari against a regional trial court's order approving or disapproving the rehabilitation plan or any order issued after the approval of the rehabilitation plan. 2013 Financial Rehabilitation Rules of Procedure, Rule 6. How about its concurrent jurisdiction? It, it has concurrent jurisdiction with the Supreme Court. See paragraph 2, subparagraph letter A on the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court and with the Supreme Court on the regional trial courts. That is paragraph 2, subparagraph B, lock seat. Same above. With the Supreme Court, Sandika Bay in a regional trial court on petition for writ of amparo and habeas data. Appellate jurisdiction on ordinary appeals from regional trial courts except in cases exclusively appealable to the Supreme Court, family courts, special commercial courts. Number two, appeal from petition for review, Rule 43 from letter A, Civil Service Commission, Securities and Exchange Commission, Land Registration Authority, Social Security Commission, Office of the President, Civil Aeronautics Board, Bureau of Patents, Trademarks and Technology Transfer, National Electrification Administration, Energy Regulatory Board, National Communications Commission, Department of Agrarian Reform under RA 6657, Government Service Insurance System, Employees Compensation Commission, Agricultural Inventions Board, Insurance Commission, Philippine Atomic Energy Commission, Board of Investments, Construction Industry Arbitration Commission, Voluntary Arbitrators Authorized by Law, and any other quasi-judicial agency, instrumentality, board, or commission in the exercise of its quasi-judicial function. Note. For Section 19 of RA 1125, as amended by RA 9282, decisions of the Court of Tax Appeals and Bank are appealable to Supreme Court via Rule 45. Decisions of the CTA Division denying a motion for reconsideration are appealable to the CDA and Bank by way of petition for review. Judgments or final orders of Central Board of Assessment Appeals are appealable to CDA within 30 days from filing a petition for review analogous with Rule 42. With respect to judgments or final orders of the CBAA in the exercise of its appellate jurisdiction, appeal shall be made by filing a petition for review analogous to Rule 43. Now, number four, petition for review Rule 42 from the regional trial courts in cases appealed thereto from the lower courts. Petitions for review under R or Rule 42 from the RTC acting as a special agrarian court, Section 60 of the Comprehensive Agrarian Reform Law. Note, see Section 7 of RA 1125 as amended by RA 9282, which grants the CTA exclusive appellate jurisdiction over RTC decisions in local tax cases, tax crime cases, and tax collection cases. Now, 
This Court of Appeals have the power to try cases and conduct hearings, receive evidence, and perform acts necessary to resolve factual issues. While under Section 9 of BP 129, the Court of Appeals has the power to try cases and conduct hearings, receive evidence, and perform acts necessary to resolve factual issues in cases falling within its original and appellate jurisdiction, including the power to grant and conduct new trials or further proceedings. The Supreme Court, however, has held that the CA's power to receive evidence is qualified by the CA's internal rules. Hence, in accordance with such rules, in appeals in civil cases, the CA may receive evidence only when it grants a new trial based on newly discovered evidence. Again, the CA may receive evidence only when it grants a new trial based on newly discovered evidence. Crispina v. Tansai, 5 or December 5, 2016, penned by Justice Leonette. Example, an appellant in a civil case pending in the Court of Appeals filed a motion for the reception of specified evidence for the purpose of clarifying facts already in the record in order that the court would be better able to resolve relevant factual issues raised in the appeal. In this case, will the motion prosper? At the time the question was asked, the correct answer was that the motion will not prosper since Section 9 of BP 129, as amended by EO Number 33, July 28, 1986, provided that the CA may receive evidence in appealed cases only when a motion for a new trial on a ground of newly discovered evidence was granted by it. Section 9 was subsequently amended by RA Number 7902 that the Court of Appeals shall have the power to try cases and conduct hearings, receive evidence, and perform any and all acts necessary to resolve factual issues raised in cases falling within its original and appellate jurisdiction, including the power to grant and conduct new trials or further proceedings. Section 9 of BP, number 129, as amended by RA 7902, approved on February 23, 1995, since under this rule, the power to receive evidence was not circumscribed, the answer to the question would have been that the motion will prosper. However, in Crispin v. Tansai, which was decided on December 5, 2016, the Supreme Court held that the CS power to receive evidence is qualified by the CA's internal rules. Hence, in accordance with such rules, in appeals in civil cases, the CA may receive evidence only when it grants a new trial based on newly discovered evidence. In effect, Crispino reverted to the rule under Section 9 of BP 129 as amended by EO number 23. Thus, the answer to the question is that the motion will not prosper. Now, let's outline the jurisdiction of the Regional Trial Court in civil cases. Original jurisdiction, exclusive jurisdiction on actions in which the subject of the litigation is incapable of pecuniary estimation. That's number one. Actions involving title to or possession of real property or an interest therein where the assessed value of such property exceeds 20000 or in Metro Manila, 50000 except forcible entry and unlawful detainer. Actions in admiralty and maritime jurisdiction where the demand or claim exceeds 300000 or in Metro Manila, 400000 Matters of probate, testate or interstate where the gross value of the estate exceeds 300000 or 400,000 in Metro Manila. Actions involving marriage and marital relations. Cases not within the exclusive jurisdiction of any court, tribunal, person, or body exercising judicial or quasi-judicial functions, like the boundary dispute between a municipality and an independent component city, municipality of 
Kananga versus Madrona, GR141375. Other cases where the demand, exclusive of interest, damages, attorney's fees, litigation expenses and costs, or the value of the property exceeds 300,000 or in the trend of 400,000. Actions for annulment of MTC judgments. Actions for recognition and enforcement of arbitration agreement, vacation or modification of arbitration award, application for arbitration award and supervision. Citizen suit under Section 41 of the Clean Air Act. Petition for assistance in the liquidation of a bank or quasi-bank filed by a receiver pursuant to Section 30 of the New Central Bank Act. Under family court, course, you have petitioned for guardianship, custody of children, and habeas corpus in relation to the latter. Petitions for adoption of children and revocation thereof. Number or letter C, complaints for annulment or nullification of marriage, those relating to marital status and property relations of spouses or those living together under different status and agreements and petition for dissolution of conjugal partnership of gains. Petitions for support and or acknowledgement. Summary judicial proceedings brought under the Family Code, Family Courts Act of 1997. Number three would be the special commercial courts. These would include cases involving violation of intellectual property rights, Cases enumerated under Section 5 of PD 902-A or fraud scheme cases, intra-corporate disputes, election cases, petitions for suspension of payments and or rehabilitation proceedings. Rehabilitation, insolvency and liquidation, or you can call it RIL, rehabilitation, insolvency and liquidation cases, brought under the Financial Rehabilitation and Insolvency Act of 2010 and those emanating from administrative proceedings, AM number 03-03-03-SC, as amended by S.C. Resolution dated 16 of June 2015. Now we have a, the Special Agrarian Courts. Original and exclusive jurisdiction over all petitions for the determination of just compensation to landowners. Concurrent would be concurrent with the Supreme Court on actions affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls. RTC's concurrent jurisdiction with the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals on petitions for certiorari prohibition and mandamus against lower courts and bodies and petition for habeas corpus and co-aranto. With the Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, and Sandigan Bayan, you only have one, the petition for writ of amparo and habeas data. Appellate jurisdiction would be all cases decided by the MTC in their respective territorial jurisdiction. Now, MTC, original, which is the exclusive jurisdiction. It includes actions involving personal property whose value does not exceed 300000 or in Metro Manila, 400000 These are personal property. Actions demanding sums of money not exceeding 300 and in Metro Manila, 400 exclusive of interest, damages, attorney's fees, litigation expenses and costs, actions in admiralty and maritime jurisdiction where the demand or claim does not exceed 300 or in Metro Manila, 400, exclusive of interest, damages, attorney's fees, litigation expenses. By now, you should already memorize 300 or in Metro Manila, 400, exclusive of interest, damages, attorney's fees, litigation expenses, and cost. Probate proceedings, testate or interstate, where the gross value of the estate does not exceed 300, 400 in Metro Manila. Forcible entry and unlawful detainer cases. 
actions involving title to or possession of real property or any interest therein where the assessed value does not exceed does not exceed twenty thousand or fifty thousand in Metro Manila exclusive of interests, damages, attorney's fee, litigation expenses, and costs. Note the RTC slash MTC has concurrent jurisdiction with the insurance commission in cases where the amount in any single claim against the insurer, excluding interest, costs, and attorney's fees, does not exceed $5 million. Again, the RTC or MTC has concurrent jurisdiction with the insurance commission in cases where the amount in any single claim against the insurer, excluding interests, costs, attorney's fees, litigation expenses, does not exceed $5 million. MTC has exclusive jurisdiction over cases or action for enforcement of an amicable settlement executed before the barangay, regardless of the amount involved pursuant to Section 417 of the Local Government Code. How about the delegated or the delegated? Okay. We have cadastral or land registration cases covering lots where there is no controversy or opposition or contested lots, the value of which does not exceed 100,000 as may be assigned by the Supreme Court. That would fall under SC Administrative Circular Number 6493, dated April 21, 1993. How about the special? Petitions for a habeas corpus in the absence of all the other regional trial judges in the province or city. So, summary procedure, we have cases of forcible entry and unlawful detainer, irrespective of the amount of damages or unpaid rental sought to be recovered, and all other court cases except probate proceedings where the total claim does not exceed 100000 or 200000 in Metro Manila, exclusive of interest and costs. Now, we go to Sandigan Bayan. Exclusive original jurisdiction. Cases or civil cases filed pursuant to Executive Orders Number 1, 2, 14, and 14A issued in 1986, or the PCGG, Cases for Forfeiture of Ill-Gotten Wealth. Exclusive original jurisdiction over petitions for certiorari, prohibition, mandamus, habeas corpus, injunctions, and other ancillary writs and processes in aid of its appellate jurisdiction and over petitions of similar nature, including co warranto arising or that may arise in cases filed or which may be filed under Executive Order Number 1, 2, 14, and 14A, issued in 1986, provided that the jurisdiction over these petitions shall not be exclusive of the Supreme Court. Now, they have concurrent original jurisdiction with the Supreme Court, CA, and RTC on this case only. Petition for writ of amparo and habeas data. Now, major jurisdiction conferred be waived. No. Or may jurisdiction be conferred, be conferred by a waiver. No. Still no. May jurisdiction be conferred by latches or estoppel? Strictly speaking, no. A party, however, may be barred by latches or estoppel from challenging the jurisdiction of the court. Thus, a petition for annulment of judgment based on lack of jurisdiction must be filed before it is barred by latches or estoppel. Example, petitioners bought a parcel of land from private respondent, Lucky Homes. Said lot was specifically denominated in the deed of sale as lot 19 and was mortgaged to the SSS, a security for petitioner's housing loan. 
petitioners started the construction of their house on lot 18 as the private respondent mistakenly identified lot 18 as lot 19. Upon realizing its error, the private respondent advised petitioners, but the latter offered to buy lot 18 in order to widen their premises. Thus, petitioners continued the construction of their house. Petitioners defaulted in their housing loan, so lot 19 was foreclosed by the SSS and petitioners' title over the certificate of title was cancelled and a new one was issued in favor of the SSS. The petitioners then offered to swap lot 18 and lot 19 and demanded from private respondents that the contract of sale be reformed to indicate lot 18 as the subject of the sale. Private respondent refused so, the petitioner filed an action for reformation of contract against the petitioner with the RTC. After trial, the RTC rendered a decision dismissing petitioner's complaint for lack of merit and ordering petitioners to pay moral damages and attorney's fees to the private respondent. The judgment became final and a writ of execution was issued. Petitioners opposed the writ, claiming that the RTC did not have jurisdiction. Subsequently, the petitioners filed a complaint with the HLURB involving the same subject matter. The petitioners then filed with the Court of Appeals a petition for annulment of the RTC judgment under Rule 47. The petitioners contended that the RTC did not have jurisdiction since the subject matter of the case was a subdivision lot and hence the jurisdiction lies with the HLURB. May the Court of Appeals annul the RTC decision in this case? The answer is no. The petitioners are now stopped from challenging the jurisdiction of the RTC. In the case of Barr, it was petitioners themselves who invoked the jurisdiction of the court, a co, by instituting an action for reformation of contract against private respondents. It appears that in the proceedings before the trial court, petitioners vigorously asserted their cause from start to finish. Not even once did petitioners ever raise the issue of the court's jurisdiction during the entire proceedings, which lasted for two years. It was only after the trial court rendered its decision and issued a writ of execution against them did petitioners first raise the issue of jurisdiction. And it was only because said decision was unfavorable to them. Petitioners thus effectively waived their right to question the court's jurisdiction over the case they themselves filed. The court frowns upon the undesirable practice of a party submitting his case for decision and then accepting the judgment, but only if favorable, and attacking it for lack of jurisdiction if not. You can find this case, Gonzaga v. Court of Appeals, GR 144-025. December 27, 2002. What are act actions in which the subject of the litigation is incapable of pecuniary estimation? Or actions in which the subject of the litigation is incapable of pecuniary estimation, RTC. Which court has exclusive original jurisdiction over a civil action which the subject of the litigation is incapable of pecuniary estimation? Of course, the RTC pursuant to Section 19 of the BP-129. How about what is meant by a civil action in which the subject of the litigation is incapable of pecuniary estimation? Before defining an action incapable of pecuniary estimation, it might be worthwhile to define first an action which is capable of pecuniary estimation. Therefore, an action capable of pecuniary estimation is one wherein the primary or principal relief sought is a claim for a sum of money or the assertion of title to or possession of personal or real property. In such a case, the action is capable of pecuniary estimation based on the amount of the monetary claim of or the value of the personal or real property. Again, 
if if it's a claim for a sum of money or the assertion of title to or possession of personal real property, then that is capable of pecuniary estimation. Conversely, an action incapable of pecuniary estimation is one wherein the primary or principal relief sought is not a claim for a sum of money or the assertion of title to or possession of personal or real property, but some other primary or principal relief which cannot be valued in monetary terms or in money terms. Example of litigations which are incapable of pecuniary estimation. Now you have mnemonics is I-R-R-C-A-R-D-S or I-R-R cards. I, specific performance rescission of annulment of contract injunction. Declaratory relief, reformation of contract, action of revival of judgment, citizen suit, action for abatement of nuisance or nuisance. Again, specific performance, that is your first S, rescission of or annulment of contract, that is your R, injunction, that is your I, declaratory relief, your D, reformation of contract, the second R, Action for revival of judgment. Citizen suit is your C. And action for abatement of nuisance. IRR cards. Can a suit for injunction be aptly filed with the Supreme Court to stop the President of the Philippines from entering into a peace agreement with the National Democratic Front? No. An action for injunction is incapable of pecuniary estimation. Hence, the Supreme Court has no jurisdiction over the same. Exclusive original jurisdiction is vested in the RTC. Is an action for quasi-delic incapable of pecuniary estimation? Quasi-delic. The answer is no. An action for quasi-delic is capable of pecuniary estimation based on the amount of the damages being claimed. You can read the case Inigo versus Puruganan, GR 166876, March 24, 2006. Example, plaintiff laundry company filed an action for breach of contract with the RTC against the defendant's spouses who had entered into a dealership contract with the plaintiff. The plaintiff's name is Marco. So Marco Bird, that defendants failed to comply with the term in the contract that they should have supply to Marco at least 20 or 200 kilos of laundry items per week and that the defendants unilaterally cease operation in breach of the contract. Marco is in, it, in its complaint sought the recovery of 280,000 damages as an incidence and consequence of the breach of contract. Did the RTC have jurisdiction over the complaint? The answer is no. An action for breach of contract is capable of pecuniary estimation where damages sought did not exceed 300,000. An analysis of the complaint shows that the principal relief sought by the plaintiff is the enforcement of the penal clause for liquidated damages, hence jurisdiction is with MTC. Parejas versus Remarkably Laundry. February 20. Another example. The Palawan Council for Sustainable Development issued a regulation that only accredited carriers may transport live fish. An action for prohibition was filed with the Court of Appeals assailing the validity and constitutionality of the rule. Does the CA now have jurisdiction over the action? The answer is no. Prohibition is not proper where the rule or regulation was issued by the government agency pursuant not to its quasi-judicial but to its quasi-legislative power. It is the RTC which has original and exclusive jurisdiction over the action which is one for declaratory relief and therefore incapable of pecuniary estimation. Chairman PCSD versus Lim is in 2016. So an action 
for foreclosure of a real estate mortgage, an action incapable of pecuniary estimation? No, it is a real action which affects the title to or possession of the mortgage. Realty as the foreclosure sale would divest the mortgager and the junior income of their title over the realty. Hence, jurisdiction is not exclusive with the RTC, but with the MTC or RTC, depending upon the assessed value of the realty mortgage. We can base it from Feria and Noche, the 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure, Provisional Remedies and Special Civil Action, 244. Another view is that a foreclosure suit over real property is incapable of pecuniary estimation and hence should be filed in the RTC, which is correct. It is submitted that the more persuasive view is to consider the foreclosure suit as a real action with jurisdiction depending upon the assessed value of the property. The principal or ultimate relief sought in a foreclosure suit is to divest the rights in the real property of the defendants, mortgagers, and junior encumbrancers and to vest the right in the purchaser. How about an action for partition of real property? Is this incapable of pecuniary estimation? An action for partition of real property. No, it is a real action capable of pecuniary estimation. That is, the assessed value of the realty. The ultimate purpose of partition is the distribution and delivery of a specific portion of the property to the co-owner. If the main purpose of the action, however, is the annulment of a deed of partition and declaration of heirs, with the partition of the property merely being incidental to the main action, then the action is incapable of pecuniary estimation and hence with the RTC's jurisdiction. Russell versus Bestil. Another example, A files an action in the municipal trial court against B the natural son of A's father, for the partition of a parcel of land located in Tai Tai Rizal, with an assessed value of 20000 B moved to dismiss the action on the ground that the case should have been brought in the original trial court because the action is one that is not capable of pecuniary estimation as it involves primarily a determination of hereditary rights and not merely the bare right to real property. What is the answer? Still, the motion to dismiss should be denied. The MTC has jurisdiction over real actions over land with an assessed value not exceeding 20000 An action for partition is a real action. Hence, the MTC has jurisdiction since the assessed value does not exceed 20000 Again, an action for partition is a real action. Hence, the MTC has jurisdiction since the assessed value does not exceed 20000 Okay, you're enjoying this. Clause 7 of the lease contract between Plaintiff Lesser and the Defendant Lessee granted the latter upon the expiration of the 10-year lease contract the right to purchase the building subject to the lease and that should the Defendant not exercise this right. The lease shall be automatically renewed and that in case of said renewal, the rental shall be adjusted by the parties depending on the prevailing business condition. The defendant did not exercise his rights, so he contended that the lease was automatically renewed. On the other hand, the plaintiff contented, contended that the lease could only be automatically renewed upon a new agreement of the parties. The plaintiff filed with the municipal court an action for unlawful detainer against the defendant. In his answer, the defendant raised the issue that the municipal court did not have the jurisdiction since the action is incapable of pecuniary estimation as the controversy hinges on the interpretation of Clause 7. Does the municipal court have jurisdiction then? The answer, sadly, is no. The complaint and the answer show that the jugular vein of the controversy hinges on the correct interpretation of Clause 7 of the lease contract.
Hence, the action was not for unlawful detainer, but one of incapable of pecuniary estimation and beyond the competence of the municipal court. Union Bank, as the owner of the Mon Lud shopping mall, entered into a contract to sell over the mall in favor of Mon Lud Homes Incorporated. The price was payable in installments, and upon full payment, Union Bank would execute a deed of absolute sale in favor of Mon Lud Homes. Under the contract, in event of rescission due to failure to pay or to violation of the contract, Mon Lud Homes would be immediately required to vacate the property and turn over possession to Union Bank. Mon Lud Homes failed to pay succeeding installments, and so Union Bank, served a notice of rescission and then a notice to pay and vacate, which Mon Lud Homes did not heed. Union Bank filed an action for unlawful detainer with the METC against Mon Lud Homes. Mon Lud Homes raised the defense that it was the owner of the mall since Union Bank did not reserve ownership in the contract. The METC dismissed the action for lack of jurisdiction. The RTC and the CA affirmed the MTC's decision. The CA ruled that Union Bank's cause of action is premised on the interpretation of the contract and the determination of the validity of the rescission, both of which are matters beyond the METC's jurisdiction. Did the METC have jurisdiction over the case? The answer is yes. In ejectment cases, the MTC has jurisdiction to preliminary determine or preliminarily determine the issue of ownership in order to determine the issue of possession. The authority granted to the METC to preliminarily resolve the issue of ownership to determine the issue of possession ultimately allows it to interpret and enforce the contract or agreement between the plaintiff and the defendant. To deny the METC jurisdiction over a complaint, merely because the issue of possession requires the interpretation of a contract, will effectively rule out unlawful detainer as a remedy. In an action for unlawful detainer, the defendant's right to possess the property may be by virtue of a contract, express or implied, corollarily, the termination of the defendant's right to possess would be governed by the terms of the same contract. Interpretation of the contract between the plaintiff and the defendant is inevitable because it is the contract that initially granted the defendant the right to possess the property. It is the same contract that the plaintiff subsequently claims was violated or extinguished, terminating the defendant's right to possess. Union Bank v. Monlod Homes, GR, 1971. The doctrine in Union Bank overturns that laid down in Morga versus Chan early on. Another plaintiff, Lapitan, filed with the CFI complaint against Iskandia for rescission of contract and for damages of 8,735. The complaint alleges that plaintiff bought from defendant a 16 horsepower ABC diesel engine for 3,735 that he bought the same for running a rice and corn mill, that defendant had warranted that all spare parts for said engine are kept in stock in its stores, that the cam rocker of the engine broke down to faulty workmanship, that it took two months for defendant to send him a replacement part, and that the new part soon broke down again. Plaintiff prayed for the rescission of the contract, the reimbursement of the price, and actual damages of 4,000 pesos. After filing its answer, disclaiming liability, the defendant moved to dismiss the complaint on the ground of lack of jurisdiction since the amount claimed is only 8,735 and it's below the jurisdictional amount of 10,000 and thus within the jurisdiction of the MTC. Should the trial court grant the motion to dismiss, the answer is no. The subject matter of actions for rescission of contract is not capable of pecuniary estimation. It is an act if an action is primarily for the recovery of a sum of money, it is one capable of pecuniary estimation. However, where the basic 
issue is something other than the right to recover a sum of money or where the money claim is purely incidental to or a consequence of, then the principal relief sought, the action would be one incapable of pecuniary estimation. No award for damages may be had in an action for rescission without first conducting an inquiry into matters which would justify the setting aside of a contract. Lapitan v. Scandia, 24 Squa, 7 or 479. It should be noted that the trial court had to inquire into specific facts, that is, whatever sufficient or whether sufficient stock of spare parts was kept by defendant in order to determine whether plaintiff was entitled to relief. In 1968, Ortigas and Company Limited and Samson entered into an agreement whereby in consideration of 55430 the former agreed to sell to the latter a land with the condition that should Samson complete the construction and painting of his house on the lot within two years, Ortigas and company would agree to refund to Samson the amount of 4820 Upon the failure of the Ortigas to pay its obligation, Samson filed a complaint to, for sum of money and damages with the city court of Manila against Ortigas, wherein Samson sought the refund of the 4820 Ortigas filed a motion to dismiss on the ground that the city court has no jurisdiction. Samson countered that the amount of the refund claim is below the jurisdictional amount of 10000 Should the city court dismiss the complaint then? Yes, the action involved is one for specific performance and not for a sum of money, and therefore incapable of pecuniary estimation. This is because what Samson seeks is the performance of Ortigas' obligation under a written contract to make refund but under certain specific conditions still to be proved or established. In the case for the recovery of a sum of money as the collection of a debt, the claim is considered capable of pecuniary estimation because the obligation to pay the debt is not conditioned upon any specific fact or matter. But when a party to a contract has agreed to refund to the other party a sum of money upon compliance by the latter of certain conditions and only upon compliance there with me what is legally due him under the written contract be demanded, the action is one not capable of pecuniary estimation. The payment of a sum of money is only incidental, which can only be ordered after a determination of a certain acts the performance of which being the more basic issue to be inquired into. That is Ortigas and Company, Limited versus Herrera. In the preceding question, which would, would your answer be the same if Ortigas Company Limited agreed to refund Samson after two years from the contract date and Samson filed a complaint against Ortigas and Company for the refund? Answer is no. In this case, the refund of 4820 is not conditioned upon any specific fact or matter, but upon the mere expiration of two years from the execution of the contract. Hence, the action is capable of pecuniary estimation and is within the jurisdiction of the city court. Okay, so which court has jurisdiction over expropriation cases? Jurisdiction over eminent domain cases lies with the RTC. An expropriation case is one whose subject matter is incapable of pecuniary estimation. The subject of an expropriation case is the determination of the government's right to take private property for public use. Example, petitioner's father was granted a free patent over land. The land was sold within the prohibitory five-year period by the father to respondents. Petitioners filed with the RTC of the Vow Oriental an action for reportes against respondent based on Section 119 of the Public Land Act. Respondent filed a motion to dismiss on ground of lack of jurisdiction, alleging that the assessed value of the land does not exceed 20,000 pesos. Rule on the motion. Motion to dismiss denied. The complaint to redeem a land subject of a free patent is a civil action incapable of pecuniary estimation. At first blush, it appears that the action filed by petitioners involved title to a possession of the lot 
he sold to respondents since the total selling price is less than 20,000 pesos, then the MTC, not the RTC, has jurisdiction over the case. This proposition is incorrect for the reacquisition of the lot by the petitioner, but incidental to and or an offshoot of the exercise of the right by the latter to redeem said lots, pursuant to section 119 of CA 141. The reconveyance of the title to petitioner is solely dependent on the exercise of such right to repurchase the lots in question and is not the principal or main relief or remedy sought. Thus, the action of petitioners is, in reality, incapable of pecuniary estimation, and the reconveyance of the lots is merely the outcome of the performance of the obligation to return the property conformably to the expressed provision of CA 141. Here's of Bautista versus Lindo. Note, applying the ultimate relief test is it is believed that the action to repurchase is a real action since the ultimate objective is to obtain title or possession over the land. Which court has jurisdiction over an action filed to determine whether the ombudsman had the power to inquire into bank deposits under Section 15, number 8 of RA 6770, even if there is no pending case? So again, which court has jurisdiction over an action filed to determine whether the ombudsman had the power to inquire into bank deposits under Section 15, number 8, RA 677, even if there is no pending case, the RTC. The action is one for declaratory relief. The Supreme Court held that the RTC has original and exclusive jurisdiction over an action for declaratory relief pursuant to Section 1, Rule 63, and Section 19, Number 1 of PP 129. Petitioners filed an action for injunction and the Supreme Court seeking to enjoin the basis conversion and development authority from demolishing the remaining structures in the Jusmak area in Fort Bonifacio de Gig. Would the Supreme Court have jurisdiction over the action? Yes. Section 21 of RA 7227, otherwise known as the Basis Conversion and Development Act, solely authorizes the Supreme Court to issue injunctions to restrain or enjoin the implementation of the projects for the conversion into alternative productive uses of the military reservation, Section 21 reads as follows. Injunction and restraining order. The implementation of the projects for the conversion into alternative productive uses of the military reservations are urgent and necessary and shall not be restrained or enjoined except by an order issued by the Supreme Court of the Philippines. There you go. Ultimate objective test. Example. A filed with the Metropolitan Trial Court of Manila an action for specific performance against B, a resident of Quezon City, to compel the latter to execute a deed of conveyance covering a parcel of land situated in Quezon City having an assessed value of 19,000 pesos. B received the summons and a copy of the complaint on January 2, 2003. On January 10 of the same year, B filed a motion to dismiss the complaint on the ground of lack of jurisdiction contending that the subject matter of the suit was incapable of pecuniary estimation. The court issued an order denying the motion. In due time, B filed with the original trial court a petition for certiorari, praying that the said order be set aside because the MTC had no jurisdiction over the case. On February 13, 2003, a. Filed with the Metropolitan Trial Court a motion to declare B. in default. The motion was opposed by B. on the ground that his petition for certiorari was still pending. Was the denial of the motion to dismiss the complaint correct? Resolve the motion to declare the defendant in default. The denial of the motion to dismiss the complaint was correct. The Supreme Court held that even if the action is one for specific performance, but the ultimate objective of the plaintiff is to obtain title to real property. The action is a real action and not one capable of pecuniary estimation. Ruby Shelter's Builder versus 
Cormoran. Gochan versus Gochan. Here, the ultimate objective of A was to obtain title to the land. Hence, the action is a real one, and since the assessed value does not exceed 20,000, the MTC has jurisdiction. Now, letter B, the motion to declare defendant in def default also should be granted because the Supreme Court has held the dependency of certiorari proceeding does not excuse the defendant from filing an answer unless he has obtained a restraining order or injunction suspending proceedings in the case. China Bank versus Oliver. Here, the air TC or RTC did not issue any injunction or restraining order, nor did B file an answer within the regulatory period. Hence, B was properly declared in default. Another plaintiff filed an action for annulment of deed of sale over land having an assessed value of 20000 A perusal of the complaint shows that the ultimate objective of the plaintiff is to obtain title over the land, which court would have jurisdiction, the MTC. A complaint for annulment of deed of sale is not an action incapable of pecuniary estimation. Where the ultimate objective of the plaintiff is to obtain title to real property, in such case it is real action and jurisdiction is determined by the assessed value of the real property, not its market value. Since the assessed value did not exceed 20000 then it's the MTC which has jurisdiction. Barangay Piapi versus Talib. A brings an action in the Metropolitan Trial Court of Manila against B for the annulment of an extrajudicial foreclosure sale of real party with an assessed value of 50000 located in Laguna. The complaint alleged prematurity of the sale for the reason that the mortgage was not yet due. B timely moved to dismiss the case on the ground that the action should have been brought in the regional trial court of Laguna. Decide. In so far as the motion to dismiss is based on lack of subject matter jurisdiction since it argued that the action should have been brought in the RTC, the same should be denied. The action for annulment of the extrajudicial foreclosure of real property is a real action since there has been a foreclosure sale and thus the action affects title to the real property mortgage. Two of his total office products and services, September 30, 2005. Since the real action was brought in Manila, and the assessed value does not exceed 50000 it is the MTC which has jurisdiction. All interested, the owner's duplicate certificate of title number 105602 over her lot to his broker X, so as to subdivide the lot. X subdivided the lot into several titles. X forged the signature of O in a deed of sale and sold one of the lots covered by a title to B. B then sold the lot to C. A new certificate of title number 137466 was issued in the name of C. O filed with the RTC an action for cancellation of TCT number 137466 of C and the revival of TCT number 105602. The complaint alleged that the land was bought by C for 15000 Judgment was rendered in favor of O. On appeal, C moved to set aside the judgment on the ground that the same was a real action, and since the value of the land was only 15000 then the RTC did not have jurisdiction. May the RTC's judgment be set aside for lack of jurisdiction? Answer is yes. An action for cancellation of TCT is a real action where the court has to determine which of two titles over the same lot is valid? In such a case, jurisdiction depends upon assessed value. Since the complaint did not allege the assessed value, the RTC did not acquire jurisdiction. Lack of jurisdiction may be raised at any stage, even on appeal. Padlan v. Dinglasan, March 20, 2013. Last one. Petitioners filed an action for recovery of possession of land against the respondents before the RTC of Baguio City. 
after trial judgment was rendered in favor of the petitioners. But on appeal, the respondents raised, for the first time, the issue of lack of jurisdiction, contending that the assessed value of the subject matter, reality, was not averred in the complaint. May the Court of Appeals dismiss the complaint for lack of jurisdiction? Yes. Based on Section 19 and 33 of BP 129, it is clear that in an action for recovery of possession, the assessed value of the property sought to be recovered determines the court's jurisdiction. In this case, the RTC, to exercise jurisdiction, the assessed value of the subject property must exceed 20000 Since petitioner failed to allege in their complaint the assessed value of the subject property, the CA correctly dismissed the complaint as petitioners failed to establish the RTC has jurisdiction over it. In fact, since the assessed value of the property was not alleged, it cannot determine or it cannot be determined which trial court had original or exclusive jurisdiction over the case. The fact that lack of jurisdiction was raised for the first time on appeal is of no moment. The defense of lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter may be raised at any stage of the proceeding, even for the first time on appeal. Years of Julao versus Spouses de Jesus, 29 September 2014. Now, we're not yet done with the jurisdiction but let us end up here and um, I'm going to read jurisdiction part two. So we'll go uh, per subject. Now, if you're not yet subscribed to our channel, please go ahead and subscribe. Hit that subscribe button and let's study together. Thank you again for your support. See ya.